Fossil hunting is for everyone, not just little kids, although little kids certainly have the, the enthusiasm. But I'm 60 years old, and I'm still thrilled about going hunting for dinosaurs, so anybody can be a dinosaur hunter. When I go out, I usually go for day trips. I usually go early in the morning so that it's cool when I'm walking into the area where I want to fossil hunt. And then I spend the entire day there prospecting. And then I walk out in the evening when it's a little cooler. In Alberta, you have to surface collect only. You cannot dig anything up. And you can only surface collect on public land or land where you've gotten permission from the landowners uh, to collect it. The more and more you're out, the better you get at spotting things that are fossilized items in the Badlands because there's an awful lot of rocks in the Badlands and so not every rock's going to be a fossil. And so it's just a matter of training your eye, I guess you would say, to look for certain things and certain colors because dinosaur bones usually are a different color than the rocks around them. I have a collection that consists of dinosaur teeth and dinosaur claws. I've got an ammonite. All of these items have been collected in the Badlands in Alberta. As a fossil collector or a fossil hunter in the province of Alberta, I am simply a custodian of these fossils. The Alberta government owns the fossils, so I'm just being a caretaker of these fossils in my collection. Bill Bloss is a nice gentleman from Calgary. He's had a passion for dinosaurs since he was a very young man. And now that uh, he's retired, he's got some free time and decided to go fossil hunting. So in the course of one of his uh, ventures in 2015, he stumbled upon the remains of what looked like an articulated leg of a meat-eating dinosaur. Articulated means that all the bones are connected the way they were in life. That got us really excited, reported the find, and uh, I took him along with a crew this summer. We went and retrieved the specimen and turned out to be uh, an articulated skeleton of a young tyrannosaur. So that ended up being a very significant discovery and uh, we hope that there's gonna be more surprises uh, that will come out of that find. The sheer number of people who report fossils, I'd say every year we get at least 100 reports of discoveries made by the general public. People definitely know that if they find something significant to report their finds, because we never know where the next big discovery will be made. There's so many potential sites in the province that paleontologists like me can't go everywhere. We can't be everywhere in the province, even though we'd love to be, but it's impossible. So that's why we rely a lot on the general public. Finding a fossil is a fantastic experience because as soon as you see it, uh, in my case, I know exactly what it is. And just realizing that this animal has lived 60 to 70 million years ago, and I'm the first one that's put my eyes on this particular bone or fossil is quite an exhilarating uh, feeling. And when you find something that the museum thinks is important, that's even better. The Royal Tyrrell Museum is incredibly important from the point of view that we specialize in Western Canadian dinosaurs. So we are one of the primary museums in the world that gathers abundant information about dinosaurs and dinosaur fossils from a very productive part of the world in terms of dinosaurs. One of the really interesting aspects about the history of the museum Although it was built and the doors opened in 1985, not that long ago, just a little over 30 years, the townspeople of Drumheller were pushing the Alberta government 
to build a dinosaur facility, a museum of some sort here, going right back into the 1940s. So for about 40 years, there was a lobbying effort to build this facility. In a sense, we can actually say that the people of Drumheller were a little bit ahead of the government in terms of seeing the opportunity for tourism, seeing perhaps the opportunity for even science to build a facility like this. It's fantastic. Working at the Royal Toronto Museum, you really get to see paleontology at the forefront. Being a dedicated paleontology museum, we get to have a large group of people who are out in the field collecting fossil material, and often the proprietors are the first people that see this material. So often we're the first person or the first person ever to touch this material, or it's the first time this material has seen the light of day in 65 or 75 million years, and that's really special and also getting to see the researchers working on cutting edge paleontology. You get to see new species being described and you get to work on that material, which is really neat. In the lab, I'm currently working on a couple of bone bed specimens. That is material from some local sites for disarticulated dinosaur material. On those right now, I'm working on doing some air scribing. Air scribing is using a pneumatic tool, kind of like a little jackhammer, and we use it to remove the matrix from the surface of the bone. So often when we have really hard matrix, we're trying to remove the material, but we need to use something a little bit stronger than a hand tool. So that's when an air scribe would come into it. At the moment, we have two fantastic dinosaur specimens that are being worked on in the large preparation lab. Uh, one of those we've nicknamed the Suncor Nodosaur. That is an armored dinosaur that essentially is a mummified dinosaur. It is preserved with not just the bones in their original position, but also with the skin impressions of the dinosaur intact. So it essentially looks like a sleeping dinosaur. And also the Fort McLeod Leptoceratops. It was collected after the 2013 flooding. It is absolutely phenomenal. It is a three-dimensionally preserved, articulated small dinosaur. It's about the size of a dog. We have a portion of the skull, but the rest of the body is completely intact. It just looks like it lay down to sleep and never woke up. And we have that preserved. I'm Dr. Kayla Brown. I am a researcher at the Royal Terrell Museum of Paleontology. And right now we're in Dinosaur Provincia Park, Alberta, which is one of the best places in the world to find dinosaur bones. And what we're doing right now is what's called field work. And that means we're going out, we're finding new sites, finding new specimens, and we're collecting those for the museum for both research and for display. So the site that we're working today is a hadrosaur or a duckbill dinosaur. It was found two years ago by students on a field trip from Queen Mary University of London. And they found the skull eroding out of the hill. So the museum decided it was a good opportunity to collect that skull because that's where most of the information about the animal is. Most of the really important stuff is in the skull. This bone right here is part of the cheekbone. This is part of the crest. And then we have the brain case and some of the lower jaws coming out on this side. Once we started collecting that, we realized most of the skeleton was there. So we're collecting the skeleton as well. Currently, we're in the excavation stage of, of this dinosaur collection. What that means is that we're currently uncovering all the bones, so they're contained in a rock. We're removing that rock, getting down to the surface of the bone, but we don't uncover all of the bone. We only uncover enough to tell what type of bone it is and what type of dinosaur it comes from. And then once that's done, we actually do some mapping. Because it's actually really important, especially in this quarry, how the bones are lying. So what orientation they are, how far they are from other bones, and in this particular case, at what angle their length. Most often we find bones laying flat, but in this particular case most of the big bones are laying like that, which actually gives us some hints as to how this animal was deposited back in the Cretaceous. Once we've mapped out those particular bones, we put lots of glue on it to consolidate everything, and then we do what's called a plaster jacket. And this is basically a way that we figured out how to transport the specimen from the ground back to the museum. So we have to make sure that this undercuts nicely there when it's setting up a bit more. It might be a bit tight. The future of paleontology is an ongoing interface between the fieldwork and new technologies. So it's actually mixing the very low tech of a pickaxe, which hasn't changed in 200 years, and some of the fancy technology, which is brand new each year. And I think the exciting discoveries are gonna be made at that interface between those two areas.